Coming up, the medical research tax flatlines at the polls, but what went so terribly wrong? Counter-protests planned as a national neo-Nazi rally marches into town this weekend. Plus, another charter school under fire. Losing a Kansas City movie icon, the Tivoli says it's go digital or go dark. And why the courts put a stop to Kansas City's red light cameras. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and thanks for joining us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, reviewing the news this week in a pithy, insightful, and engaging way from News Radio 981 FM, KMBZ. Bill Grady, the Kansas City Star's nationally syndicated reporter, Mary Sanchez. KCTV5 chief investigative reporter, Stacey Cameron. And star political reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. This week, the Jackson County medical research tax flatlined at the polls. But who could have predicted voters would have rejected the sales tax measure by a whopping 84% to 16 percent. In June, backers of the tax say their private polling showed substantial support for the concept. So what happened, Dave Helling? Well, everything. I mean, you know, when you get a vote that's almost 70 points, uh, uh, you know, 70 percentage points difference between yeses and noes, uh, that's a real message from the voters that virtually nothing about the tax was found attractive. Some people were worried that it was a sales tax that hurts the poor. Others thought it was an unfair uh, subsidy for largely private businesses, the hospitals, the researchers who would come here. Some were quite angry at the idea of having a single issue on the ballot at a cost of a million dollars to taxpayers. And then the proponents never really made an argument that, that uh, A, this tax was necessary, $800 million over 20 years, and B, it would bring benefits to the people of Jackson County. And for all of those reasons, it, it was a historic loss. It's hard to remember any ballot measure that was uh, so soundly rejected by the voters. It's not as if they were short of money, though, Mary Sanchez. The proponents spent like $2 million on this campaign. They did, but it probably came um, not too little too late, but too much too late. It just, they had not built that necessary push behind it that this was necessary. And so people had all those other really valid reasons to say no. And then I do think just having that one issue on the ballot really hurt them. All the, And the rain that day, all that you had were people coming out who were absolutely going to be fervently against it. And then they had to depend on the people that were really the employees of these institutions to go ahead and vote for it, and it just it didn't work out. Well, turnout was about 14 percent, Stacey Cameron? Right, and you look at that, and that might actually be a high number for an off-year election where there was only one issue, and I think that really goes to the fact that at a ratio of five to one, people rejected this. And I think if you're going to look at this and say, really, really, where did the loss go? It's for Kansas City's old-school political elite, I think. Mike Sanders came out and was a proponent of it. The Kansas City Greater Chamber of Commerce proposed it. You had some of the old political consultants like Steve Glorioso working on uh, the tax in favor of it, and they lost. I think it simply comes down to voter fatigue here in this area, Jackson County, particularly in Kansas City and areas like the plaza, that just feel they're overtaxed by these regressive uh, half-cent, quarter-cent, eight-cent sales tax, and I think it was finally the message, enough is enough. Is this it for medical research tax, this whole effort in Kansas City, uh, Bill Grady? Not by a long shot. At the supporters party the other night, that's something they made very clear. Now, when Russ Welch took the podium, immediate past chair, Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, he talked about we're going to go forward. Dave Westbrook, VP of Children's Mercy, this is not a loss, it's a setback. And e even with 80 percent or more saying no? Well, it, that's a pretty big setback. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, there is a thing in this world known as a spin, but, but, <laughs> but uh, Dave said that and I think everybody agrees on the fact that whichever way they go on there, so they're not going to get public financing because it is a huge amount of money. And frankly, I'm not sure that the proponents ever fully understood or fully made the public understand what is translational medicine. That's so there was a huge disconnect. But they say we're going to make it happen because it's going to bring jobs, which the other side says the only jobs it's going to bring are rock star researchers. It's not going to have any impact on the general populace. But they're not proposing it with a tax in the future, though. No, no. And, and as a matter of fact, Bob Kipp with the Hall Family Foundation made it very clear there is, there's not enough corporate money out there. He said it was difficult to raise the $2 million 
to finance their campaign. So can you imagine what it would be like to raise $40 million annually? Stacy, Right. This was such a speculative investment type tax increase. You know, in other words, we had to spend this money to hopefully get a huge economic benefit in extra jobs and researchers to come in, but there was no guarantee. And when you didn't see private money coming in and when you didn't see foundational money coming in, then why were taxpayers going to be put on the hook or why were they going to allow themselves to be put on the hook for an investment that may never pay off? So I think a lot of people stepped back and said, this isn't the zoo or this isn't, you know, public improvements to parks or infrastructure, something that I can see and may benefit me. This is a huge gamble. And I'm not willing to take it. Dave. The biggest question I think going forward, because Bill's right, they're not going to try and put this tax back on the ballot for decades perhaps, if ever, uh, is whether or not this vote damaged the chances for other tax measures uh, in 2014 and, below, uh, and beyond. There are a whole series of projects potentially on the runway, fixed rail transit, uh, the KCI bond issue, some people are worried that may now be in trouble, not because sales taxes are involved, Nick, but th they're worried that the voters have a taste for saying no, that they learned it's easy to say no, that, that it is okay to say no to some of these projects. And, and so there was a lot of chatter I heard this week from civic leaders and others who say they're really concerned that this no vote may have damaged other potential projects in the future. Mayor James has talked about some sort of sales tax for infrastructure maybe on the ballot next year. That may be delayed uh, unless they can be convinced that voters will, will set this incident or this vote aside, but they're not sure they're ready to do it. Do you do agree that. with that assessment, Mary? Um, I understand where it's coming from. I don't necessarily disagree. But I, I think it is a part of the equation of what people are going to be looking at. But I think really it was this issue. It was just kind of such a murky, fuzzy thing for the average person to wrap their head around. How does this benefit me? They see it these big institutions and it gets into almost issues of class. You know, who should be paying for this? Well, the Hall family will build a building, but then you guys have to pay for the rest of it. When you talk about brick and mortar thing, your sewers, other issues, people get that. People are far more likely to up there was also some frustration, like very quickly, frustration that it was just Jackson County. Absolutely. A lot of Jackson Countyans were saying, why do we have to pay for this by ourselves? Now, remember, sales taxes, in some sense, are by state taxes because people from out of Jackson County would have bought things. But by and large, people believe that sales taxes are located only in their yeah. jurisdictions. And there were a lot of Jackson Countyans who were saying, hey, let Johnson County, let Wyandotte County, other counties pay for it as well. In other news this week, a national neo-Nazi rally is planned Saturday on the steps of the Jackson County Courthouse downtown. The event hosted by the Detroit, Michigan-based National Socialist Movement encourages the attendance of, quote, all white patriots and coincides with the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht, also called the Night of Broken Glass, in which the Nazis torched synagogues, vandalized Jewish homes, schools, and businesses. This is not the first time there's been such a rally in Kansas City, and I'm assuming, while local officials don't care for it, they had no choice but to allow them to gather and speak on the steps of the Jackson County Courthouse, Bill Grady. They don't have much of a choice because these are public places, but the interesting sort of 11th hour thing that came out of this was the Kansas City Police Department issued a 15-point security memorandum yesterday, which according to the ACLU goes way beyond the pale because they're talking about banning things like sticks that you place signs on, you can't carry water bottles, you can't carry anything that could be used as a projectile what couldn't be used as a projectile? So they are mounting a legal challenge, and I think the, the overriding thing here is that the police department probably aimed this more at the people that will oppose the National Socialists than the group itself. Now, there are some major counter-protests as a result of this. The main one is at Liberty Memorial. But why are they meeting at, uh, for this rally at Liberty Memorial when this is happening at the Jackson County Courthouse, Mary Sanchez? Well, for the exact reason that the police are trying to stem this, is that you, the worst, worst case scenario is if we have some sort of confrontation and brawl. And unfortunately, all it takes is one person who rightfully is very offended by these groups' views. All it takes is one person, and these groups know how to rile it up, too. Yell something, throw a water bottle, um, step out of line towards somebody in an aggressive way, and all heck could break loose. We don't need that here. The proper response is what's going to occur at Liberty Memorial, where hopefully there will be masses of people, numerous, 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 far and above the number of the neo-Nazis, and speaking out on what is right and what this community stands for, and it's not what this group is. 
Well, and, and Mary touched on that. I mean, the reason is you want to put as much distance between the two groups, the protest and the counter-protest, as possible, because while this neo-Nazi group is coming in saying they're going to hold their rally, there's also invites out there in, in some people wondering whether or not other hate groups are going to come, like the KKK and the Aryan Nation, who aren't promising to keep things non-violent. Now, whether or not the neo-Nazis would follow through with that, everyone has their rightful doubts. But it's their First Amendment right. I think we have to support their right to go out to do this, sure. but it's an unfortunate thing to see unfolding in Kansas City. Mary hit the nail right on the head. Hopefully, right-minded Kansas Cityans and people from around this metro come out and go to Liberty Memorial tomorrow and protest against these folks. Yeah. You're not going to change their mind. You're not going to be able to have a real heartfelt, honest conversation with someone who has shown up in a Hitler uniform. You know, I mean, you're, you're just not going to. So why would you even try and do that? I mean, I understand why people would want to. I understand the animosity, but it's not going to come to a good outcome. But you do have some Latino organizations who will be at the Jackson well, County we'll Courthouse at 3 o'clock on Saturday. We'll see. Ooh. The times are a little fuzzy, and, you know, even that is a little fuzzy with the neo-Nazi groups. I mean, if you look at their... I mean, they know they've riled up quite a bit. They've got a lot of publicity, and they haven't done a darn thing yet. So part of their whole marker has already been met. You know, they may not even show up, or maybe they'll show up at a time that people aren't expecting them to. And thankfully, maybe then there won't be a group of opposition. Chiming in on what Mary said about Liberty Memorial, I spoke with Leonard Zeskin, longtime social activist here, and, and, and he's sort of coordinating the umbrella group that's, that will be at Liberty Memorial. And one of the things he said is it is the appropriate place yeah. because it honors war veterans. We are that's going right. to have some World War II veterans who actually fought the Nazis. And the other thing is that those particular individuals don't really want to be around someone that they had to fight against, or at least their forebearers. So. In other news this week, no more red light cameras in Kansas City. The city this week suspends enforcement on its 29 red light cameras in the wake of a Missouri appeals court ruling that says such programs violate state law. Kansas City has decided to not enforce about 5,600 pending red light camera tickets and more than 16,000 warrants for unpaid fines. Since the program started in 2009, the city has netted about $2 million a year in revenue from the cameras. So does this mean you can now go through these red light camera intersections in Kansas City with impunity, Bill Grady? No. No? No, no. I mean, still against it, the law, is it? It <laughs> is still against the law. And, and here is the way that the police department is handling it. They are not going to, you know, this was a, a multi-tiered process. If you blow through a red light and you're caught on a camera, does not automatically mean that you're getting a ticket. That audio, and excuse me, that video, those clips go to an independent police officer. They look at it and decide. That process is now on hold. They're not going to mail out any more tickets. They're saving the video. Okay, but you are also an attorney mm -hmm. as well as being the chief investigative reporter at KCTV5. So we benefit from that legal wisdom, Stacey Cameron. But what was it about that Missouri Court of Appeals ruling that said there was a problem with these kind of ordinances in the state of Missouri, Stacy. That legal word called due process. When the red light cameras, at least the one in Ellsville, would snap Which is just in picture, suburban St. Louis. Correct. When you would go through the red light and the picture would get snapped, it would catch the car or the license plate. And so the owner of the vehicle would be cited, not necessarily the driver. So now you're finding me for something that I might not have done. And the court went on to say that that law is essentially in violation of state law, the, the municipal ordinance, because state law says running through a red light is a moving violation. You have to get the person who commits the violation, not the owner of the car. So they wiped it out. And we'll see. It's probably going to go up to the Supreme Court. But right now, though, it has thrown the Kansas City ordinance into limbo. But it does mean a lot of revenue for the city, Dave Helling. We're talking about $2 million a year. That's a lot of money that that the yes. city would have to make up if it does go to the Supreme Court and they decide, yes, these ordinances are illegal and you cannot have them. Right, and, and, and revenue in other cities too. It isn't just Kansas yes. City, Missouri that uses this, this mechanism. So uh, as a political matter, it's almost certain that there'll be some attempt to address this in the next session of the legislature, regardless of what the courts do. Now, whether or not this legislature would endorse the use of uh, red light cameras is an open question. There is a, a quasi-libertarian argument that this is somehow unfair to drivers. So it is not a slam dunk, for example, that state lawmakers would change the law and legalize this uh, this process that Stacy just talked about. But there will certainly be discussion of it. Cities have 
come to rely to some degree on this revenue, particularly for their police department. So it, it's an open issue and will be debated, I'm sure, in 2014. Not to hash out the legal points too far, but it was the same appellate court that just a couple of years ago said that these types of cameras were legal, they were constitutional, and it went back to say, you know what, we were wrong. That's bad law. We're going to reverse ourselves now that we looked at it a little bit closer. And I think there's a good chance that the Supreme Court's Court is probably going to uphold this decision. Well, there is also, though, I mean, there, there are certainly the legal considerations that will be hashed out within the courts and all the challenges. But the bottom line is, why is it, other than raising some money, we need to stop people from running red lights. I mean, there is a safety factor that the police do look at. And so I don't think everything's going to be thrown out the window because there was some, you know, evidence that it did, sl it slows me down. I know where some of these are. And I will kind of check myself and be hitting the brake a little bit as I'm coming up to these Mary, lights. Mary, I, I don't need a red light camera to drive cautiously every time I'm on the road. I'm just holier than thou. Okay, we're going to move on, ladies and gentlemen, on this Week in Review. Continuing uncertainty over the future of the Kansas City, Missouri School District has only helped boost attendance at the city's charter schools, where one in three district students now get their education. But that doesn't mean a trouble-free experience. The State Department of Education just discovered some alarming findings on a recent surprise visit to one of those 21 charter schools, Hope Academy. The first was shocking discrepancies in attendance numbers. Only 27 percent of students were in attendance at the time of the surprise visit, yet the school was reporting a 99 percent attendance rate. Academic integrity is also being questioned. State officials say a teacher accepted $700 from a student in exchange for academic credit he hadn't earned. But don't charter schools have sponsor agencies that are supposed to be monitoring and overseeing their activities, Mary? Mm -hmm. They do. Um, and UMKC was the one involved here. And they have been, well, like you understand with Gordon Parks, when that came up last year, another charter school um, that was going to have their charter revoked and pulled. That came up in the state conversations of who is really in charge. At what point does the state, are they able to come in and hold the um, agency, like the UMKC, the sponsoring agency, accountable? Or is it on the school? You know, who's involved in what? There's also the issues of board governance. That came up with the Derek Thomas Academy and all of their problems. The board, in my view, should have been far more knowledgeable about what was going on there. So you have a lot of different entities, and they're still trying to figure out who's on first base, who's in charge when it comes to these charters. It, it should be a compilation of everyone so that you have a lot of eyes and ears on. Stacy. Well, their charter is uh, up before the end of the year. UMKC was going to go through the review process, so there's a lot of question right now whether or not Hope Academy will be around, at least as a UMKC charter school, yeah. next year. I think one of the things that's so unfortunate about this instance is that Hope Academy was for students who had dropped out and the audacity of the board at that school to think they could push through numbers of attendance at 99.5% and it wouldn't raise an eyebrow. In this instance, the school would get more funding based on attendance. And if they were fudging those numbers, and there's evidence for that, I think we should suspect to see possibly state charges for fraud against whoever was there. We've seen so far that the superintendent, the COO, and the CFO have all been placed on administrative leave. This could be a story that plays out for a while and we potentially see criminal charges. Does this show, though, the fact that the state was going in doing surprise visits like at this charter show that the law is actually working, though, and that there is a, a, a clampdown on charter schools in the state of Missouri? Uh, well, it worked potentially in this particular case, Nick, but but I think even uh, uh, administrators with the Department of uh, Education would tell you they don't have enough people to do all the supervision that needs to be done. Uh, and again, I think this plays into some discussion you may see next year in the legislature because school choice is one of the great sort of default options uh, for, for problems in education in places like Kansas City, Missouri. And to the degree there's a perception that charters or other schools outside the normal process are doing no better than the public schools, that idea of school choice may, may, may go down in some legislators' eyes. And, that, and that's an important point because you look at, at three of the academies that we've, we've talked about recently, charter schools, Hope Academy, Gordon Parks, and the Derek Thomas Academy, right, all, of all of them had trouble with academic performance, particularly when you look at Hope Academy. Uh, 
80% of the kids were not proficient in English and language art. I think it was around 80 or 90% were not proficient in math. And, and so we're seeing a lot of problems with these charter schools in the Kansas City metro area that's supposed to be alternative and, and at times better alternative education for students, and they're not keeping that promise. So I think there does need to be greater oversight by DESE in these instances. Could one of Kansas City's oldest and most iconic independent movie theaters be forced to shut down? The Tibble Theater in Westport says it's go digital or go dark. By year's end, movies will no longer be made on 33 millimeter film. That means any theater that has not converted to the new industry mandated digital projection system will be out of business with a price tag of over $70,000 per auditorium. That's $210,000 to the Tivoli. They've launched a Kickstarter internet campaign to try and raise the money. There's a lot of other movie theaters, of course, with plenty of screens here in Kansas City. Is the Tivoli worth saving, Stacey Cameron? Absolutely. Within two or three months of having moved to Kansas City three and a half years ago, I found Tivoli because of the independent films, the documentaries, films you're not going to see or likely not to see anywhere else in Kansas City. They're running two great documentaries right now, one of them, Muscle Shoals, that you're not going to see on any other screen. If this goes dark January 1st, what a loss for the arts community here in our city. They also, uh, Stonewall Uprising, which was a great um, uh, documentary that had aired on PBS that you all uh, offered for free for people to come over there and see. Great things that go on there in terms of films and arts that are go away. So hopefully people step up. It is a large commitment monetarily. I think they're, they're somewhere around $140,000, $150,000 short right now of keeping the, the theater open. Uh, but, you know, there's only really maybe two other theaters that, that offer this kind of thing in Kansas City, and none of them in the downtown metro. So this will be a huge loss. But there must be, but again, there must be other theaters, though, that have this problem of going digital. Um, this is not the only theater that has this problem, presumably. Well, no, and there was actually uh, interesting that you say there was a drive-in theater uh, out in Kansas that, that saw the same uh, problem, and it was a small mom and pop and, uh, organization, and, and they got people in the community to step up and raise money here. But when you look at some of the bigger theaters, uh, like the Screenland theaters, that maybe have more ticket sales or, or the big chains, it's not as big of a commitment because they have larger ticket prices. They make more of a profit. For someone like the Tivoli, which is privately owned, you know, that is a big investment uh, that, that hopefully it's stays open. If people haven't been there, I, I really suggest they go down and see it and find out what kind of a gym this is, and, and we really need to rally. And try Not to everybody is familiar, Mary, with Kickstarter. Is that an odd way to be raising money to try and save a theater? I think it's one way for them to raise it. I mean, it seems like a, a giant fundraiser would be wonderful if they could also maybe do that in collaboration with the Kickstarter. Part of the deal with the Kickstarter, though, is that you would, well, you, you promise the money, but you don't have to give it unless they actually reach the goal. So they either reach the goal or they don't reach the goal. There's no, well, we got part way there and then let's also pile on with another new initiative. It's you make it or you don't. And that that's a little dicey. That's a little scary for them to be hanging on that. But they say they're halfway towards the goal right now and they've just been doing this this week. Right, for just a couple of weeks. So I think it's it's gotten some spin and some positive uh, coverage in the press this week. Obviously, you're talking about it now, uh, but it's still a large hill for them to climb. Former Missouri Congressman Ike Skelton was laid to rest this week. We didn't have a chance to talk about his passing last week as we were debating the medical research tax on this program, but Skelton spent 34 years representing the 4th District of Missouri in the U.S. Congress. His legacy is what, Dave Helling? Uh, a legacy of strong support for the military. Uh, he was a throwback, the, the socially conservative Democrat. You don't see those many uh, uh, much anymore in national politics. And he was dedicated to serving his district's a district. I wrote a column this week that suggested that trend is going away too. People are now elected on the basis of ideology more than they are accomplishment. You were at the funeral this week, Bill. I was not at the funeral. I did. I we did cover it sort of with our reporting partner. I think one of Ike Skelton's big career points will be civility. I I'd had a number of conversations with him about that. And although he was caught on a live mic one time referring to an opponent with an expletive, for the most part he was he he just was appalled at what's going on in Washington now. He was a very erudite guy. He's, he, and he. He liked the process. He liked the process of considering all the points, even with people he didn't agree with. You don't find much of that anymore, and so it really is. He's not just a conservative Democrat that is a, an endangered species, but civility as well. 
Stacey Cameron. Well, and one of the things I think you've heard uh, in people remembering uh, Congressman Skelton was his uh, service to the military. He had wanted to serve in the military, but because of polio at a young age, he didn't get that opportunity. But he had been regarded as one of the uh, civilian, greatest civilian supporters of the military that we've seen in this country over the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, he served as the uh, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and I think his commitment to the military is going to be sorely missed. Mary. Absolutely. I mean, it is the military. Um, and just kind of, you know, that whole, that old school that is now literally passing type of politician who did stand more for their area, their district. He worked so strongly with the military. That was his cause. You know, as opposed to running on this ideology. I and mean, I think, I mean, the, that's the country's loss, not only of a Ike Skelton, but that sort of mindset of how politics and democracy is supposed to work. Yeah, the, the, just quickly, the dysfunction in Washington is almost completely caused by the lack of Ike Skelton types who are still in Congress. You, you just don't see that much anymore. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Mary Sanchez, and from KCTV5, Stacey Cameron, from KMBZ, Bill Grady, and the Star's Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.